Today we're in 2 Samuel chapter 3. We're going to be looking at uh, the entire chapter and it really relates to uh, vengeance, an act of vengeance that we're going to be seeing take place when we get to the conclusion of the chapter. But let's begin reading together here in 2 Samuel at chapter 3 verse 1. We'll read to verse 5 and we'll get into our study. 2 Samuel chapter 3 beginning at verse 1 reading to verse 5. Now there was a long war between the house of Saul and the house of David. But David grew stronger and stronger, and the house of Saul grew weaker and weaker. Sons were born to David in Hebron. His firstborn was Amnon by Ahinoam, the Jezreelitess. His second, second was Keliab by Abigail, the widow of Nabal, the Carmelite. The third, Absalom, the son of Maacah, the daughter of Talmai, king of Geshur. The fourth, Adoniah the son of Haggit, the fifth, Shephatiah, the son of Avital, and the sixth, Ethriam, by David's wife, Ugly, no, Egla. <laughs> Every time I read that, Egla, it, doesn't it look like it's, it's, your name's Ugly? But maybe it's just me. These were born to David in Hebron. And so what we have here, as we begin chapter 3, very basically is, uh, David has been recognized as king. David was recognized as king by the men of Judah, as we saw last time. And the men of Israel had actually rallied behind another king who was the uh, son of Saul. His name was Ishbosheth, which means son of shame. And so what we have is we actually have a rival kingdom going on at this time. We have the uh, nations of Israel excluding Judah. We have the, the uh, rather the the tribes of Israel following after Ishbosheth, but Judah is following after the leadership of King David. Now, as we saw last time, uh, Saul's son reigned for two years. And over those two years of his reign, there was division. God had declared that David was to be king over Israel. All the way back in 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse 14, God said that he had a man after his own heart that was going to to be ruling and reigning as the king. In chapter 16, verse 1 in 1 Samuel, uh, God said, I've provided myself a king amongst the sons of Jesse. David was that king, and David was the one who was anointed to be king. Abner was a commander over the armies of Israel. He's the one who had put Ishbosheth in the place of king. And so what you have is you have problems that are taking place for the first few years of the reign of David. And it would have taken some time for a transfer of power to, to occur. That's why in verse 1 he speaks of a long war between the house of Saul and the house of David. But David grew stronger and stronger. The house of Saul grew weaker and weaker. And so what you have is you have a continuous series of battles going on. David growing stronger and Saul's house getting weaker. Now at this time David is marrying and he's got more wives. Remember he had one wife who was the daughter of Saul. Her name was Michal and uh, she was given to somebody else. So David has now been taking to himself wives. You see the list of wives here in verses 2 through 5. Not only do we see his lists of wives, we also see a list of sons. There are six wives who are mentioned and six sons. Now, during this time, David had been adding wives. We need to ask ourselves, why was he doing that? During the period of, of David's um, reign and all, it was commonplace for kings to have more than one wife. It normally would represent that that king had the ability to provide for more than one woman. And so he has six women mentioned as his wives. Now, that was not God's plan. If you want to look for God's plan concerning marriage, you look to Genesis chapter 2 verse 24 because there at the beginning, God says, a man shall leave his father and mother, be joined unto his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. God's intention for marriage was for one man and one woman over one lifetime. That's how God created marriage. So what David is doing is he's violating what God has commanded. Now, when you look in the Old Testament, there are a series of books at the beginning of the, of the uh, Old Testament. And the fifth book is the book of Deuteronomy. In the, De in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 17, verse 17, you actually have some rules that regulate the behavior of kings. 
And there in second, rather in the, the 17th chapter, verse 17, it says, Neither shall he multiply wives for himself, lest his heart turn away. God stated in the beginning that the king that would ultimately be reigning was not to have more than one wife. What you have here is a violation of the word of God. Now in David's life, he had a son, a son by the name of Solomon. We know that Solomon had 700 wives and 300 concubines. And the Bible tells us that in his, in his uh, older age, when he became old, his wives turned his heart after other gods. And so what we have is we have David violating God's word, Genesis 2.24, Deuteronomy 17.17, 17, by multiplying wives for himself. And the result is going to be some real problems in the home. We see that these women are mentioned as well as their offspring. Ahinoam had Amnon. Abigail had Kiliab. Now it's possible that he may have died when he was young because he's not mentioned again. You have Machab who had uh, Absalom. She was the daughter of a foreign king. You have Haggit who bore Adonijah. You have Abital who bore uh, Shephatia. And you have Eglah who had a, a young man by the name or a baby by the name of Ethriam. And so he had multiple wives contrary to God's word. This is something by the way that he doesn't get away with. Because amongst these sons, we do see Amnon. Amnon was guilty of a forcible rape of his own sister Tamar. And you also have a man by the name of Absalom, who was the full brother of Tamar, who ultimately killed, uh, killed his brother Amnon. And also went on to try and take the kingdom from his own father. So David... David's family suffered because of his violation of the word of God. God had stated you not to do this. David did it. His family felt the sword from that day on. And so what we have here is we have a list of the names of the sons of David and his wives. But Michal is not mentioned here. We'll see her in just a moment. Verse 6. And now it was so while there was war between the house of Saul and the house of David that Abner was strengthening his hold on the house of Saul. You see, Abner was the, the kingmaker. He was the one who put Ishbosheth into the place of being the king. And so it's pointed out that he's strengthening his hold on the house uh, of Saul. Saul had a concubine whose name was Ritzpah, the daughter of Ayah. And so Ishbosheth said to Abner, Why have you gone into my father's concubine? Abner became very angry at the words of Ishbosheth and said, Am I a dog's head that belongs to Judah? Today I show loyalty to the house of Saul, your father, to his brothers and to his friends, and have not delivered you into the hand of David. And you charge me today with a fault concerning this woman. May God do so to Abner, and more also, if I do not do for David, as the Lord has sworn to him, to transfer the kingdom from the house of Saul, and set up the throne of David over Israel, and over Judah from Dan, which is the north, to Beersheba, which is the south, and he could not answer Abner another word because he feared him. So what's going on here? For Abner to sleep with, which is what is taking place, with one of the concubines, one of the women who was in the harem of Saul, for Abner to be sleeping with this woman is one of the ways to attempt to get the power of the throne. Because... In sleeping with this woman who belonged to the king, he's basically taking power or usurping power for, the, for himself. He's making a claim for the throne. And so Ishbosheth knows this, and that's why he rebukes him. But when he rebukes him over this, notice that Abner gets vengeful over it. It says in verse 8 that he became angry at the words of Ishbosheth. He said, Am I a dog's head that belongs to Judah? When he says, Am I a dog's head that belongs to Judah? It's another way of saying, Am I a traitor? Am I a worthless traitor? Now it's interesting to me, he says, I show loyalty to the house of Saul, your father, to his brothers, to his friends. I have not delivered you into the hand of David. You charge me today with a fault concerning this woman. He's not, he's not in any way uh, admitting to his guilt. What he's trying to do is present himself as being somebody who's done favors and therefore this is owed to him. And he's saying to him, in essence, you know, I think I deserve this. I have shown you loyalty. I haven't delivered you to David. So what's the big deal anyway? Why are you getting so upset? And then he moves on and he says, May God do so to Abner and more also if I do not for David as the Lord has sworn to him, if I don't deliver this kingdom to him. So basically what he does is he makes a threat. 
He's saying, I know that David's supposed to be king and I'm going to transfer the, Lord, uh, the, uh, the kingdom over to him. It's interesting that he knew that David would be king, but he still tried to get power. But now he's saying, I'm going to transfer Israel to David's control. And there's nothing you can do about it. Now, as he's saying this, Abner is undoubtedly there with several of these uh, men, his, his men at arms, his bodyguard. And uh, it would seem that Ishbosheth probably is looking at Abner and looking around to see if there's anybody who will back him. And there's nobody there who's going to back him up. And that's why verse 11 tells us that he was afraid. He couldn't answer Abner another word. He feared him. This is a man that was a commander. This is a man who was a warrior. This is somebody that you didn't get angry. And he got him angry. Now what this shows to me that he's a powerful warrior, that he has loyalty of his men, that he has great influence, but what's dangerous about it is his power was not under anybody's authority. And when you are a powerful person and you have nobody that you're accountable to, you can be dangerous. Because you got nobody to answer to. Nobody's going to call you on anything. One of the wisest things you can have is you can have people around you that you are accountable to. In ministry, I have people I'm accountable to. Because I could start doing things the way I think I'm supposed to do it with no accountability accountability to anybody else but I have boards I have friends I have I have co-pastors pastors that I have relationships with that that I definitely have an accountability to because I don't want to be the kind of person who has power with no accountability because when you don't have it when you don't have accountability you can do whatever is right in your own sight and you can end up doing all kinds of things that are wrong and that's what we see taking place here he has nobody that he's accountable to and and the, even the king himself is afraid of him so he answers him not another word well, as this is taking place, verse 12, Abner sent messengers on his behalf to David, saying, Whose is the land? Saying also, Make your covenant with me, and indeed my hand shall be with you to bring all Israel to you. David said, Good, I'll make a covenant with you, but one thing I require of you, you shall not see my face unless you first bring Michal, Saul's daughter, when you come to see my face. And so he says to him, listen, and this is how this is going down. This is what he's saying here. When he asks the question, whose is the land? What he's saying is, God may have given you the land, but I'm the one in control of it. All you have is Judah, and you're there in Hebron. I have the rest of Israel under my control. You've only got the tribe of Judah recognizing you as king, but seeing that God has given you the land, you haven't possessed it, I have control of it, we can work something out. If you give me an assurance of security, I'll make your dream a reality. I'll release everything that I have any kind of influence over, and I'll deliver it to you. And that's what he's saying to him. Now as David hears that, notice verse 13, David says, good, I'll make a covenant with you, but I'm going to require something of you. I want you to return Michal to me. Now, why would he care about that? I mean, David's been gone for several years. He hasn't been with Michal. Why would that be a big deal to him? Well, it would restore him to a right position. It would actually right the wrong that was bestowed on him when Saul gave her to another man. When Saul gave Michal to another man, it was a public act of humiliation towards David, and he was disavowing David. He was saying David is no longer part of the royal family. And so David is basically saying, I want my standing restored in the eyes of Israel. And I want to be restored in my position in, in the royal house. And so as he says that, well, notice verse 14. David sent messengers to Ishbosheth, Saul's son, saying, Give me my wife Michal, whom I betrothed to myself for a hundred foreskins of the Philistines. And Ishbosheth sent and took her from her husband, from Paltiel, the son of Laish. Then her husband went along with her to Bahurim, weeping behind her. So Abner said to him, go, return. And he returned. And so David says, listen, Saul made a demand of me. What Saul had actually demanded was a hundred foreskins of Philistine warriors. David had given him two hundred foreskins as a dowry. So he's saying, she belongs to me. I paid the dowry and I want her returned. And so when he does that, Ishbosheth sent and took her from her husband from Paltiel, the son of Laish. Now notice his response, the husband's response. Her husband went along with her to Bahurim, weeping behind her. And Abner finally had to say to him, go, return. And re he returned. So what is this? Well, they'd been together for eight or nine years. And over those eight or nine years, they obviously fell in love. They loved one another. Now, 
Michal at one time was David's only wife. She was the first wife of David. Now she would be joining a harem, so it wouldn't be in her interest to come and join a group of other wives, and so she's going to be treated differently. But beyond that, she's in love with this man, and the man's in love with her. He, if he weren't in love with her, he wouldn't be weeping as he's following her. I find that interesting. If he didn't love her, he'd probably be throwing confetti in the air and laughing and blowing these little party favors. Yeah, she's gone. But that's not how he's responding. How he's responding here is with tears because they've been together, they've made a family, they've made a home. He loves her with all of his heart, obviously, because a Jewish man would not follow in a public fashion, weeping in this way, if it wasn't breaking his heart. And as she's going there, she's entering back into the life of David. This man, Abner, finally has to turn to this man as he's, he's following all the way to the outskirts of Jerusalem. And, and Abner finally says to him, go home. Get out of here. There's nothing you can do. And he returns with a broken heart. Now that doesn't bode well for David in the future with Michal. And we'll see this later on. But in verse 17, Now Abner had communicated with the elders of Israel, saying, In time past you were seeking for David to be king over you. Now then do it. For the Lord has spoken of David, saying, By the hand of my servant David, I will save my people Israel from the hand of the Philistines and the hand of all their enemies. Abner also spoke in the hearing of Benjamin, then Abner also went to speak in the hearing of David in Hebron, all that seemed good to Israel and the whole house of Benjamin. So Abner and twenty men from him came to David at Hebron. And David made a feast for Abner and the men who were with him. Then Abner said to David, I will arise and go and gather all Israel to my lord the king, that they may make a covenant with you, and that you may reign over all that your heart desires. So David sent Abner away, and he went in peace. At that moment, the servants of David and Joab came from a raid and brought much spoil with them. But Abner was not with David in Hebron, for he had sent him away, and he had gone in peace. So Abner goes through with his promise to deliver Israel to David. He has 20 men. They make a trip to Hebron, David's home. David entertains them. Abner declares that he'll gather all the people, hand them over to David that he might be king over them. And David is agreeable to this. Everything's fine. Abner leaves in peace. But Joab has shown up. Notice verse 23. When Joab and all the troops that were with him had come, they told Joab, saying, Abner, the son of Ner, came to the king, and he sent him away, and he's gone in peace. Joab came to the king and said, What have you done? Look, Abner came to you. Why is it that you sent him away? And he has already gone. Surely you realize that Abner, the son of Ner, came to deceive you to know you're going out and you're coming in, to know all that you're doing. So he's absolutely livid because he's afraid. He's afraid that he's not going to have an opportunity to make his, have his vengeance. So he tells him, Abner's really there to spy on you. He's not there to help you. Now David at that time doesn't disclose to him the true plans, what's taking place. He simply just allows him to, to say what he's saying. But notice what happens, verse 26. When Joab had gone from David's presence, he sent messengers after Abner who brought him back from the well of Sirah. David did not know it. Now when Abner had returned to Hebron, Joab took him aside in the gate to speak with him privately and there stabbed him in the stomach so that he died for the blood of Asael, his brother. Vengeance, anger. This was a man who his anger was so great, his anger was so great that he could not be in any way, shape, or form placated by anything less than the death of Abner. Joab is so upset. Now, Joab is the commander in David's army. Joab is also his nephew. Asael, who died, was Joab's brother. And when he and his brother came upon the body of their brother who has fallen there, in their heart they said, Abner's not going to get away with this. They were absolutely furious over it. And what happens is you have this lust for vengeance. It's called a blood lust. During that time and before that, there was something called the avenger of blood. If I have a brother who died at the hand of another, I would take it upon myself to avenge my brother's death. And if somebody killed him and I found him and killed him, it would actually be an honorable thing for me to do. Because that was true, because Israel was aware of that taking place, they actually established what are called cities of refuge. Cities of refuge were numbered in, se there were seven of them in the nation of Israel that were called the cities of refuge. 
And the people of Israel, if I accidentally killed somebody or there were some circumstances that extenuated so that somebody died at my hand, I knew that the brother would be coming after me, that a close relative would come after me. The first thing I would do is I'd go to the city of refuge. And I went to the city of refuge. As I was there, I would remain there. Now I was safe and protected there. Nobody could harm me as long as I stayed within the city boundaries. Now if I walk out of that city before the high priest dies, I'm there safe until the high priest dies. When the high priest dies, then I can go out safely. But if the high priest is alive and I step outside of the city, if the avenger of blood is waiting for me and kills me, he can do so without anything happening to him for doing that. And so what we have here is we have an instance where Hebron is actually a city of refuge. When Joab sends a messenger uh, to go and get Abner, I want you to notice this, verse 27. Notice how it says, when Abner had returned to Hebron, Joab took him aside in the gate to speak to him privately and there stabbed him in the stomach. He didn't allow him to come into the city because if he had come into the city, Joab couldn't have killed him. He had to stay outside of the city and that's why he took him to the city gate but he wasn't, he wasn't into the city proper yet. And that's why he stabbed him. And I want you to notice something else. He stabbed him in the stomach. When Abner killed his brother Asael, you remember with me that Asael was running after Abner and Abner turned and saw him and he says, is that you, Asael? And he says, turn aside to the right, turn aside to the left, don't be pursuing me to your own hurt. But the guy wouldn't stop running. So he keeps coming after him and he finally says to him, look, take the armor of another young man who has fallen. Take his armor and get honor from that. But don't come after me. Why are you doing this? And ultimately, because this young man Asael was as fast as a gazelle, he caught up to him. When he caught up to, to Abner, Abner took the blunt end of his spear and rushed, pushed it through him and hit him in the stomach and it came out his back. And that's why you see the picture here. He stabbed him in the stomach because even as you stab my brother in the stomach, I'm stabbing you in the stomach and that's how this went down. Vengeance, this desire to get even, drove him to the point where he's willing to kill a man, a man who, who did not deserve to die because he, he didn't know all the details. Joab didn't know the details of how, how Abner had told his brother, stop pursuing me, you're going to end up hurt. Stop pursuing me. And Asael wouldn't turn aside. And so when he, when he killed him, he killed him as a warrior, kills another warrior. And he wasn't guilty of the sin of murder. And he wasn't guilty of manslaughter. And so what we have here with Joab is vengeance is in his heart. He's got this, this desire within him to kill and he's going to do it no matter what. When people have the blood, they call it blood in the eye. When they have that mentality, there's hardly anything you can do to turn them away. When, the, when they have this lust for blood, when they say, I, there's nothing, nobody can, can talk to me about this, nobody can stop me, it's very difficult to deal with. And that's exactly where this man was. He killed this man and he did so before he could enter into the city because had he entered into the city, he would have been free. And so what happens is he stabs him there even at the gate. Now, verse 28, afterward, when David heard it, he said, My kingdom and I are guiltless before the Lord forever of the blood of Abner, the son of Ner. Let it rest on the head of Joab and on all his father's house. Let there never fail to be in the house of Joab one who has a discharge or is a leper who leans on a staff or falls by the sword or who lacks bread. So what he does is he pronounces basically a curse on him and he's saying, I am guiltless in this, but Joab is going to have to pay the penalty. So Joab and Abishai, his brother, killed Abner because he had killed their brother Asael at Gibeon in the battle. And then David said to Joab and to all the people who were with him, Tear your clothes, gird yourselves a sackcloth, mourn for Abner. King David followed the coffin. So they buried Abner in Hebron. And the king lifted up his voice and wept at the grave of Abner. And all the people wept. And the king sang a lament over Abner and said, Should Abner die as a fool dies? Your hands were not bound, nor your feet put into fetters. As a man falls before the wicked men, before wicked men, so you fell. And all the people wept over him again. David is, is clearing himself from this, and he's telling everybody, I want an open display of, of mourning over this. Tear your clothes, gird yourself with sackcloth, and mourn for him. And notice what he says in verse 33 when he says, Should Abner die as a fool dies? Abner was deceived. 
He said, this man was really somebody that you should have respected. This was a man who was a great man. And he was deceived into this. And he shouldn't have died in this manner. And all the people were weeping over him. Now in verse 35, when all the people came to persuade David to eat food while it was still day, David took an oath saying, God do so to me and more also if I taste bread or anything else till the sun goes down. Now all the people took note of it and it pleased them since whatever the king did pleased all the people. For all the people and all Israel understood that day that it had not been the king's intent to kill Abner the son of Ner. Remember that Abner had 20 men who followed after him. They saw this open display of mourning. They saw that David made Joab dress in mourner's garb, which is an open humiliation of the man who killed the man. And so they see this, and what happens is the word begins to circulate throughout Israel, so they understand that David was guiltless in this. But as this is all going down, verse 38, the king said to his servants, Do you not know that a prince and a great man has fallen this day in Israel? And I am weak today though anointed king. And these men, the sons of Zeruiah, are too harsh for me. The Lord shall repay the evildoer according to his wickedness. Don't you understand what has taken place? He was a great man and he shouldn't have died that way. And though I am king, my power has not yet been solidified. And my nephews, the sons of Zeruiah were actually his nephews, my nephews are too powerful and too influential. But I want you to see this. Notice how he says, The Lord shall repay the evildoer according to his wickedness. They will be dealt with. Sometimes we think that we get away with things. You do something that's wrong and you didn't get caught immediately and so you think you got away with it. You took something out of the till you stole something from the back. You did something that you know is wrong. You just didn't get caught. So you figure you got away with it. I read about somebody who, a true story, who had filed a false uh, tax, um, filed his taxes falsely, and and got a, something like a $4,000 refund. And he liked it so much that he did it again. This time he was trying to get a trillion dollars and they caught him. True story. I mean, he, he wrote out the, that he was supposed to get something like a trillion dollars back. I mean, what worked for him once he thought would work for him a second time. And sometimes people will do something and they... They, they didn't get caught, so they think that they must have gotten away with it. Therefore, I can do it again, and nobody's going to be the wiser. Sometimes we do that. Sometimes you may do that. Sometimes you may, you, you may be the kind of person who's been able to get over and get things the way you wanted them, and, and you figure that uh, you can just charm anybody and, and uh, get away with it. When I was in high school, uh, I... I, I did a lot of things. It's been a long time since I've been in high school, but I still remember this. I did a lot of things that got me into the, my counselor's office quite often. I can still remember the first time I went into Mrs. Willett's office. I was 14 years old, and I remember walking in, having a conversation with her, and she said, I've never heard your name before. And she said, that's a good thing, because if I've heard your name, that means you're a troublemaker. I still remember her saying that to me. And I, and I said something back to her, like, oh, you'll never hear my name again. Well, I was there all the time for the next four years. She and I got very close, Mrs. Willett. And I used to walk in, and I would sit down at her table and visit with her, and I, I always charmed her. It was very, just something I would do. I'd sit down, hi, Mrs. Willett. David, why are you in my office this time? And I'd say, well, you know, uh, I don't know, but you know, you look nice today. Did you do something with your hair? You know, and I would do that, and, I, and, and she, oh, yeah. I, I'd say, you know, I have to tell you, it looks great. You know, and I would do that all the time, and we, we became very friendly. I never got in trouble. I mean, I'd get in trouble with the teacher, but never with my counselor. And I learned how to get over. And I, I discovered that if you smile and you charm and you act innocent, very often you get away with it. I can remember one of my teachers, my math teacher, senior math. I still remember it. He got mad at me, and he, he didn't send me to the office. He took me to the office. 
And so he takes me to the office, and there I am standing in front of Mrs. Willett, and I've got my hands folded, and I've got my legs crossed, and I'm sitting in front of her. I've been there so many times, I'm very comfortable. This is my chair. And, 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 and as we're talking, my, my teacher's really angry, and, and he's saying, and he this, and he did this, and he did this. And she looks at me, she says, David, did you do that? And I smiled at her. I still remember doing this. I smiled, and I said, may I ask a question? She said, of course. I said, is it right for teachers to swear at students? She says, no. I said, he cussed at me in class just now. He just swore at me in class. She turned all of her anger on my teacher. Let him have it. How dare you speak to a student that way? You're not to be using language like that. And he's looking at me, and I've got that smile that, you know, that you'd like to slap off my face. And I was just, just smiling at him. I said, you just don't know. And I used to do that all the time, all the time. Got away with it. And I got to the point where I thought I could lie myself out of anything. I, I went before the judge. I remember going before a judge and lying to his face after taking that oath. I swear to tell the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help me God. And I lied right to his face and got away with it. Because I was an expert liar. That's what prepared me for ministry. No, I was, an, I was an expert liar. I was a thief too. Isn't that funny, but it's true. I was a liar and a thief, and God put me in the ministry. I'm still amazed at that. But I would lie. I would lie at the blink of a hat. I would lie to your face and you wouldn't know I was lying. I was so good at it. So good at it. And I got away with it. I didn't get caught. I walked into a store. I had stolen a jacket. I walked into the store. The jacket didn't fit me. I walked into the store with the stolen jacket and I was wearing it. And I walked up to a salesman and I said to him, jacket's too big. I'd like to exchange it for one that fits me. The guy says, don't tell me that. You just took that off the rack. I said, no, I didn't. This was given to me as a gift. I got it for my birthday. And I want to exchange it for one that fits me. And the guy looks at me. He says, wait a minute. He walks away for about five, ten minutes. And I just stood there waiting. He came back. He says, okay. And I went and took another jacket. Stole that jacket too. And I used to do it all the time. I used to walk into stores and steal things. I'd go and sell them and buy drugs. I did that all the time. I was very good at lying and stealing. And I thought that before I, if I stand before God, I really thought that I could charm him out of hell. I thought I could, God, you know, smile at him, you know. You, you know, you look good for an ancient God. You know, I thought I could charm him. You know, and, it, and I, a lot of people to this day think the same way. They think that God is going to grade on, uh, on the curve. That there's going to be somebody worse than you standing next by. So you can point to him and say, I was bad, but that one's worse. So you should let me get in. Maybe not them, but me, yes, for sure. I wasn't really that. I only stole a little bit. I only lied once in a while. I was only drunk once in a while. I only beat my wife occasionally when she deserved it. I mean, we'll do that. We lie. We, we cheat. We steal. We do all these things. And we think that when we stand before God... God is going to say, you know what, it's okay, no big deal, like he's a grandfather. See, when my, when my grandchildren do something bad, I kind of just smile. When they do something real bad, I really smile because I think that my prayers were answered. That's what I prayed for, that your kid would be as bad as you were and, <laughs> and now deal with it. I don't have to do anything other than love them up. You go spank them. God isn't a grandfather. God has no grandchildren. God is a father. And God judges rightly. When he says, the Lord shall repay the evildoer according to his wickedness. Well, Job chapter 4 verse 8 says, Even as I have seen, those who plow iniquity and sow trouble reap the same. You reap what you sow. When you sow to the flesh, Paul said in Galatians chapter 6, from the flesh you reap corruption. When you sow to the Spirit, from the Spirit you reap everlasting life. God is a just judge, according to Psalm 7 verse 11. God takes into consideration all information. In our court system, a person can be flat out guilty can even admit that they did something wrong and yet can still get a trial. And they can go before a judge 
and they can plead their case even though there are tapes, even though there are eyewitness accounts, and they will go through the judicial system standing before a judge even though they are 100% guilty. True story about a guy who was uh, a lawyer who was defending a client, and he said, my client was in one of these lineups, and he said that the victim was identifying who may have been the perpetrator, pointed out this guy's client and said, that's him, that's him, he's the one who did it, he did it with four, he and four other guys. And he says, and my client yelled out as he was being pointed out, he's a liar, there were only three of us. <laughs> Very intellectual criminal. But there are a lot of people who make, they think they can get away with things and our system actually allows for that. So they think that when they stand before God, that God is going to look at them and not have all information. David is saying that's not true. David is making it very clear that the Lord shall repay the evildoer according to his wickedness. So, bringing it to New Testament sense, I, as I read the Bible, know that all sin and fall short of the glory of God. That there's none righteous, no, not one. That means that I sin in thought, word, or in action. When I stand before God and God says, you're a sinner, I can do nothing other than admit the fact I am. Yes, I am guilty, flat out. I mean, I can't lie to God. All things are open before him. He sees it all. He has all evidence before him. So if I stand before God in my own explanation, I stood before a judge and I remember saying, when the judge says, how do you plead? I said, guilty with an explanation. I try to explain the circumstances surrounding why I did what I did. I'm guilty, but I want to give an explanation. It doesn't work that way with the Lord. I can't give an explanation. I can't give an excuse. I have to say I'm purely guilty. That's what it is. And so when I stand before God, because he's a righteous judge, because he's a just judge, and I stand before him, I am pure guilt standing in front of God. That's why I needed Jesus Christ. That's why I need him. Because the Bible says that the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. And so as I came to Christ as my Lord and Savior, and I said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner, the blood of Jesus Christ washes me and cleanses me so that now I become a new creation. I become the temple of the Spirit of God who dwells within me. I'm not a religious person at all. I've become made right with God through a re regeneration. I've been born again. Now I stand before God. Jesus is there with me. He's my defense attorney. There is a, a, an attorney that's a prosecuting attorney. He's presented that way in Revelation 12. It, it's Satan himself who accuses the brethren uh, day and night before the throne of God. And so the enemy can say David is guilty because he's lied and he's stolen and he's been all of these things and, and, and I'm guilty. But my, my Savior Jesus stands and says, But Father, he has received me. My blood has cleansed him. And my Father at that point says, Not guilty. Now I'm not guilty, not because of righteousness that I've done, any good things that I've ever done. I am not guilty based on what he did on my behalf. So yes, God is a righteous judge. God does judge. But God has given to us mercy through Jesus Christ. And that's why it's a wise thing to turn your heart over to the Lord. Because he washes you and he cleanses you. Not only does he do that, he gives you the power to live for him. And he gives you a strength and he writes his law on the tablet of your heart. So the things that you do that are good are, are done not simply because you read something from the outside, but because he placed it on the inside. And you begin to follow him with all of your heart because your heart has been transformed by the work of God. That's what the Bible means when it says, if anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. So in the time of David here, he is saying, my nephews are too harsh. What they have done is putting them in a position of being dealt with. God will repay the evil according to his wickedness. David's saying, but I'm not guilty of that. I didn't do it. In the New Testament sense, God still repays the evildoer according to his wickedness. But when that evildoer turns to the Lord Jesus Christ, they are transformed from being an evildoer to one of God's own children. And at that point, we can stand before God guiltless. And all of my sins have been cast aside. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed my sins from me. And they're not brought back up. He doesn't remind me of them because they are dealt with. 
I learned something from the Lord that I have exercised with my children, and my children will tell you this is the truth. Even to this day, if my children do something that is offensive to me, hurt me, or sinned against me, we'll have a talk. I'm not one of these dads who just ignores it. We'll have a talk. And after the talk is done, and after we've dealt with the situation, my kids will tell you this is the truth. I'll turn to them and I'll say, we won't have a conversation about this again. It's over. It's been dealt with here, and we won't repeat this anymore. It's gone. I don't repeat things that have been dealt with. It's over. We're going to start over from this point on, and I don't bring it up to them. I learned that from the Lord, because the Lord doesn't remind me of what I've been. He doesn't say, oh, don't you remember when you... I remember. My heart condemns me, but God is greater than my heart. He knows all things. I remember my own testimony, but God doesn't bring it up to me. He doesn't say, oh, you've always been a drunk. Oh, you've always been a doper. Oh, you've always been whatever. He doesn't say that to me. He says, you're new in Jesus Christ. You're brand new in him. I don't bring those things up because those things have been dealt with. Now, if I didn't have a relationship with the Lord, then he'd have to bring them up because that's what I'm judged on the basis of. But now that I have a relationship with the Lord, those things are under the blood of Jesus Christ, his son. He's cleansed us from all sin, and we can move on into a life of righteousness because of him. And that's the wisest decision anybody ever makes, is to ask God to cleanse them with the blood of Christ.